kind of like a, I don't know, kind of like a conclusion to a book, you know, if you, a lot of books have like an introduction and the, at the end they kind of have an epilogue, like what happened after, you know what I'm talking about? What they call it, an epilogue. And this is kind of like the epilogue to John. The main part of the story is kind of finished and he finished John chapter 20 with the purpose statement for the book. And you know, you know that people would believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And so now it's kind of like what comes after, you know, that last little bit of information to let you know everybody what happened to everybody after the main story. And so um, it kind of finds us with the setting of the disciples, what they're doing afterwards. You know, they had already seen Jesus. They had already seen the, you know, the wounds in his hands and in his side. And, you know, believed on him that he was raised from the dead. And, and um, so, you, you know, Jesus kind of left that meeting and they kind of went back to being by themselves and kind of follows the, the immediate story of what happened to them right here in, at the end of John before you get into the rest of the, you know, their ministry in Acts in the following chapter. So let's read John 21, 1 through 14. And actually, where am I going to break? I think I'm going to break it up into two, two readings. The, it's just 14 verses. Let's just read it. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, which is the same as the Sea of Galilee. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with the fishes. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw the fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty-three. And for all there were so many, yet not yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? And Jesus then, Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. And so um, if we get into it a little bit later, but if you remember, Jesus had told them where to go and wait for him. And it wasn't fishing on the sea of Galilee. It was... Uh, it was it was back to a, a, a certain place on a mountain, and which was their instructions. And so here you find them kind of reverting back to their old careers. You know, they were called, they were commissioned, right, to be full-time uh, gospel apostles, to go and share the, the gospel with everybody. Um, you know, he's, he's told me, even as I came, so send I you. You know, they were officially given their duty but while he was gone from them, they got to thinking and maybe got a little bit discouraged and for whatever reason decided, you know what, I'm just going to go back to fishing. And, and uh, Peter decided and the rest followed him. So this is where Jesus found him. And so this, you know, this kind of chapter, like I said, kind of takes a, a, a change in, in how how the book is being written, you know, it's, it's more of a, like a post uh, conclusion or epilogue to the book. And so y y you see 
kind of a comparison between self-effort or spiritual power. And, and that's something that we struggle with too. I know I do. Am I going to go out and do what I want to do? Or am I going to do what the Lord has called me to do? Am I going to go out and do things under my own power, my own efforts? They were obviously professional fishermen, experts. They knew where to put the net and when to go. It says they went night fishing. They knew all the tricks of where the shoals of fish usually happen during which season. You know what I mean? They, they were raised in the business. They, and, and so they, they went back to what they knew, right? What they were good at, what they were understood and could be successful at in their own minds. But that's not what the Lord called them to do, is it? That's not what their job was really, uh, what they were here on earth to do, what they were here for. And you see the difference between when they were, even, even their own jobs, when they were fishing under their own, you know, idea of where to go, when to go, which side of the boat to throw the net on, all of that was completely unsuccessful, right? But Jesus, with just one little sentence, he completely changed that nighttime fishing trip around from the, probably, the, you know, as unsuccessful as you can get to completely getting skunked. And so if you're, if you're a fisherman here today, no doubt you've gone before and gotten skunked, right? Didn't catch anything. That's kind of the story of my life with fishing. I remember, even as a kid, it's probably mostly my dad. I inherited it from him. We were, li we were living in Georgia. We went down there to Georgia for kind of one of my dad's furloughs. Like he was a missionary to the Navajo Reservation. And BBF missionaries typically will go four, four years on the field, and then take a year to report to all their churches, you know, take a, a year off. That's especially foreign missionaries. But I think we took about nine months, and he went around and reported all the church. Uh, over time, some churches will close or drop your support, so you try to raise a little bit more support and get your support back up before you go back on and get ready to start the next church or whatever. So we were living in Georgia. My brother Bobby had moved down there and married a girl from Georgia. That's why we ended up down there. And uh, we were going to this little church, and this man just told us, you know, I went out there to this certain lake under the bridge, this certain bridge, and we caught 150 crappie in four hours. So we went that very next night to the same lake, to the same bridge, at the same time. And we even bought these little floaty, have you seen those floating styrofoam lights? You hook up to a battery and they float on top of the water and shine the lights down. It attracts the minnows, which then attract the crappie. We had all the same equipment, the same bait and everything. Guess what? No fish at all. Zero. If I could count how many times that same similar scenario happened to us, you know, we will go right here, we're catching them left and right, and then we go out the next day, or the next, you know, that day, or whatever, nothing. And so, in, in growing up in New Mexico, in, in New Mexico, and then right on the border there, crossing Colorado, it was like that a lot with trout. Trout are so finicky, they'll just apparently for no reason, just be biting really good, and then the very 30 minutes later, nothing. You can't get a Nothing will bite. It doesn't matter if you try bait, lures, flies, you know, whatever you try. They're just not interested in eating at all for some reason. They just, they're done. And that's usually about the time that I show up to the river to start fishing, you know. It's, Man, come on. And so, I know what it's like to be skunked like these guys were. We're in John chapter 21. But Jesus, when Jesus showed up there, everything changed, amen. It changed everything. It changed their, you know, their, you know, the position of, of which side of the boat they were casting. It, and, and, and at first, when he told them to cast that, they didn't even know it was Jesus yet, and it says. And, but it, it definitely changed the results of their expedition, didn't it? But they, so they were brought kind of face to face with their own inadequacy. You know, you're, you say you're going to go fishing, and this is supposed to be what you're good at and what you know and your area of expertise, but... Here we are, right? You've been all night and have caught nothing. And, and so it kind of illustrates the, you know, the contrast between depending on myself and depending on the Lord and His Word, His will for your life. You know, we all have things that we're, you know, we've learned that we're good at or try to be, right? Our area, the, the, whatever your particular 
job or some of the jobs you've had, you've learned certain skills and gotten pretty good at it, where somebody like me that's never done that before, no earthly idea how to do that would completely fail. And this is by the way, it's really crooked. And so, you, you know what I'm saying? Some other you know, skills and hobbies you've learned. And you know all the terminology and the ways. You know, I remember uh, when I was really learning photography there for about a year and a half, I got really into it. Learned all kinds of ways and how to do lighting <coughs> and exposure and, and even how to tell people when you're taking a, a photograph, it helps a lot of times if you put your face, your chin out forward, kind of like a turtle, and that makes your, you know, your double chin kind of go up and it enhances your jawline. And then you click the photo, and in the photo you can't tell that you're sticking your neck out if you were to the <laughs> side. But it makes your jawline look a lot better. Just little tips and tricks like that. You learned all of it, and then two years later, put the camera in the closet and never pick it back up, you know. And there. In that two years, though, that I was a year and a half, I was really intense and learned a lot. And that, but that's been my problem throughout my whole life. I can't hardly, you know, my attention span doesn't allow me to keep going with things. Uh, I wish I would have stuck with learning the guitar when I was 13. I took price, I don't know, eight or ten guitar lessons and learned all the chords and a few finger style methods and a few strumming methods, you know, for the different timing. I, I actually played in church for a while. We had at our church in, in Farmington where Brother Curtis Harvey, we actually had a band, Brother Curtis Jr., who's with the Lord now, would play guitar and his daughter would play bass and they, they had a, Wanda would play the drums sometimes with the keyboard and we would sing all these hymns and it sounded really good and learned a lot, but then, you know, after a while, you know, I got old, put it by the wayside and I, I I've always thought, man, if I would've just kept at it and kept learning and gotten better, it worked. I could have been a really good guitar player, but no, a, a year or two was enough for me. And then went on to other things. That's how I've always been. But these these people, their whole lives, even their childhoods, you know, I, I believe it's the the, the 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 sons of Zebedee. Their dad was a fisherman, so they were raised in the business. But still, when it was up to just them and their flesh and their knowledge, they didn't. It was inadequate, wasn't it? Wasn't enough. They didn't catch anything. He got scooped. But just one appearance from Jesus changed everything. Amen. And so you see the contrast between them and what the Lord has done. When you depend on the Lord to provide for you, amen, and the Lord's power to do what he's called you to do, it makes a huge difference, amen. And so these options belong to everybody that's a Christian, don't they? We could go live in our own uh, power and and I've been teaching Sunday school long enough to where I can study, and I'm not not claiming to be good at all, but I can do it in my own power. I can go through the the book of John and, and bring out a few things that I notice and look at the concordance and do a few word studies and what the Greek word means and look at a few commentaries, which is always what I do, and, and uh, bring out some points that maybe you didn't notice immediately or maybe cross-reference it with a similar verse that brings more color to the story. And, you know, that you can do that too. Most of you all can do that too. But if the Lord's not in it, amen, if the Lord's not behind it, if I don't come and, and I'm not, I'm walking in the flesh, I've got unconfessed sin, you know what I mean? It's not going to amount to much, is it? But if, but if I really am prayed up and confessed up and, and asking the Lord to, to help me and, and depending on Him to, to help through His Holy Spirit to challenge people, to convict people, to pursue people, to, you know, enlighten and, 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 and illuminate people and, and help me and, 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 and depend on Him and His power, then that lesson all of a sudden transforms from something that most likely I'm going to get skunked at as far as spiritual results to something that can really make a difference in people. Lives, amen. And so that's just one illustration, you know, of a simple Sunday school lesson. But our lives are like that, aren't they? Um, we tend to be like Peter, and uh, you know, I'm going to go back to fishing. I'm going to go back to what I know and my usual, you know, rut that I'm in. And and that's you know that's the easiest path, right, for us because we can walk by sight and not by faith. And just, you know, I'm going to just do what I'm going to do. I'm going to, you know, go to work, go home, go to, 
eat and go to sleep and spend some time with my family and spend some time maybe entertaining myself with reading a book and watching TV or playing a video game and go to bed and get up the next day and go, and pretty soon you wake up and years have gone by and you've been in this rut, right? But what about doing what the Lord's called you to do? You know, he said, said even though, even like I came, so send I you. Our job is to be out there and being a witness for him in the world, right? And, and getting people saved, discipling people, and, and, and uh, encouraging other Christians, you know, all that stuff. But can we do that without him, without his power, and without his uh, filling of his spirit, and without being attached into that spiritual vine? And, and the answer is no, not successfully, no. So all of us have this same choice they did. We can either go on our own and do what we want, or we can go and follow the Lord and do what He wants in His power. And there's a big difference in results, is what I'm saying. A, a dramatic difference in results. And that's what we want, amen, is spiritual results. God has called us to be fishers of men. We want to catch fish, amen. We want the result. And and even though sometimes we get skunked, and sometimes, the, especially in this old, cold, hard world, they're not biting very good, it doesn't mean we can just stop going, amen. We just need to refocus, keep going. Going and make sure we're going in His power, under His authority, under His will, and that we're filled with the Spirit. We're confessed up of all of our sins and and uh, not walking in the flesh. And and uh, we will see also, I believe, dramatic results. So, um, uh, the, the the book in, in John chapter twenty one it says after these things, and there's a kind of a little space of time between the last time we saw Jesus talking to them. In the room, remember, Jesus just appeared, and then next week he appeared with Thomas there. And then after that story is done, the little time has passed. We're not sure exactly how long, but after these things, he showed himself again. Amen. And so there's a little bit of time that's gone by. And then uh, he, if you will notice here, he's unrecognizable. It, it mentions who, who all goes, the, these disciples. But when he was coming, it said Jesus in verse 4 stood on the shore... But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. And, and, and this happened, remember, with Mary. He, she thought he was the gardener. You know, she didn't recognize him. Uh, apparently, unless he manifested himself or made himself recognizable to them, they, you know, in his new glorified body, they, you know, didn't, he was unrecognizable to him. But, but he revealed himself. And then, oh, that's the Lord, you know. And so, you know, Herod had built this seaside town called Tiberias where his, I don't know if it was summer palace or some kind of governmental thing and so they renamed the, you know, the, the, the Romans did the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias so that's why it's commonly called that if you remember in the Old Testament it was known sometimes as the Sea of Chinnereth or Chinneroth and then in Luke 5.1 it calls it Lake Gennesaret do you remember that? So it has several different nicknames and names, but uh, the official name at this time under the Roman rule was the Sea of Tiberias. That's why there's a little bit of confusion with which body of water it was. Um, so there's seven apostles mentioned here: uh, Peter and John, of course, Thomas, Nathaniel, and it says two others. We think they're probably Andrew and Philip because they were they were uh, associated with the sons of Zebedee, you know, with their fishing venture from the early part of the gospel, but it doesn't say their name, John doesn't choose to name them, so we're not 100% sure, but they do have close ties to them. So, but, you know, the first hint that things aren't right in the disciples' life, like I said, is their location. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to read that to you, Matthew 28, where Jesus tells them where to go, okay, it's Matthew 28, 16. <coughs> <coughs> It says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed him. Them. Sorry. So they knew. It doesn't say the name of the mountain or which one it was. But the certain place, he appointed them to go. And they're not there, are they? The story finds them not in the right place. And sometimes that's the best way to know that you're not in the will of the Lord. Our feet can take us to the wrong places, can't they? Or our eyes can take us to looking at the wrong things, or ears, or whatever. You, 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 your, your Lord usually wants you in a, a certain place in your life, doesn't he? Sometimes we can find ourselves going to places we're not supposed to be. And that's where that, the Lord found him that day. You know, 
maybe they waited around for another week and thought, well, a week went by and he came and, and saw us with uh, Thomas, the doubting Thomas. And, and so we've waited another week, he's still not here. Maybe he's not coming back, let's go. Or whatever their, whatever in their mind their thinking was, they probably lost patience and decided, all right, that Peter famously said, I go with fishing. And see, and then everybody else immediately decided to follow him. Sometimes you got to be careful who you follow, don't you? That's right. Sometimes even people that are godly Christians, sometimes even pastors and, and leaders, people you respect and have loved and respected for years, can go the wrong way, can't they? They can get away from God and make mistakes. I, I, went, I graduated Bible college in 1994. There's a lot of guys that we went to school with who started out in the ministry and got in trouble, you know, either got out of the Lord's will and got backslidden and left or made some moral mistake and disqualified themselves from the ministry. Unfortunately, that's a lot more common than I thought. But whenever that kind of stuff happens, sometimes a, a certain percentage of the people of the church, they'll just, they're done. They're, they leave. And, and, and evidently, on you know, they weren't, they were following a person, you know, not following the Lord. Because pastors and leaders and godly friends and relatives, you know, people we look up to, sometimes they can mess up, can't they? And sometimes they can, uh, sometimes, like when I was a uh, first church we went to, after Bible college, I had an admissions internship at the Bible Baptist Church in Stillwater where we could go to the men's advances. And that pastor I was under, uh, Brother Dave McCracken, about a year after I left, he left, and a new pastor came. And when he left, you know, one of the guys that was the main man in the church, when I was there, you know, taught, taught an adult Sunday school class and was probably the top, one of the top soul winners and, and uh, you know, one of the, you know, did the baptisms, you know, kind of one of the main people in the church, just left the church. He didn't join another church. He just was done, I guess. Never did. You know, he died. He died about 10 years later and never did come back. And it was like, why? Why well, don't you just stay there for the next pastor, you know? Or if you don't like the new pastor, join another church or whatever. Why just quit and just be done? Because your pastor, he, I think he went into full-time evangelism is what he did. He didn't, the pastor didn't quit or anything. And I don't know. Why? But my only thing is maybe he was following the man, not the, you know, not the Lord. And sometimes we can, we can, we can, you know, follow the wrong thing. I'm not saying not to follow the pastor, but don't follow him in such a way where if he makes a mistake or moves on to another church or whatever, that you're just, you know, that's it, I'm done. That's that. You, somehow you were following the wrong thing there, okay? And so, um. Yeah, we do are supposed to follow the pastor, but also, you know, ultimately we're following the Lord. So if the, you know, another Christian we very greatly respect and look up to messes up, doesn't mean we ought to go with him, right? Doesn't mean we ought to, you know, we've had people here that we thought were genuine, just committed Christians just leave and never come back. Just they're gone. I thought they were one of us. The Bible talks about that, doesn't it? We thought they were one of us, but apparently they weren't. And I, that's a very rough paraphrase. Is they went out from among us. And, uh, you know, there's some empty pews here where we used to have very faithful, very faithful people. And they just, you know, whatever happened, they got mad at God. Or they found an unsaved, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend to pursue. And then just, boom, that one relationship was worth all of this to them. Because they just dropped it like a hot potato and took off. And somehow the priorities were out of whack there. Somehow I feel like they didn't maybe ever have what I had with the Lord. You know what I mean? And I say that with great caution because they're but for the grace of God go I. Amen. And, and I'm so thankful and so, so uh, you know, very thankful to the Lord <coughs> that when I tend to start going astray and start getting backslidden, it's not very long before the Lord starts getting after me. And it can get scary pretty fast if you don't listen to him. You know, if he starts the chastisement and turning up the, the fire under your feet, 
If you still keep going south, it's going to get a lot worse, a lot faster. That's been my experience with running from the Lord and getting out of His will. Is you know, he, he wants you like a good parent to do right. He if you if you start getting out in trouble, he knows the danger of that. You know, and and that's one of the marks of Christianity. If there's no chastisement in your life when you run from the Lord or get out of His will, then there's something wrong there. Because the Bible says if you're really one of His, there will be chastisement. And that just means a, a, a spanking, very basically, to get you back in the line like a parent would a toddler. And so uh, I, I've been there too, and I've done that things and gotten backslidden and stuff too. But the, the Lord, you know, just like here, He's gonna He's gonna pursue them, all right. And so, um, and, and there's several reasons for this, and and and, and, and we'll get into them as we, as we go through here, but. Um, they probably didn't feel adequate, one of the things, to carry on the ministry. For one thing, the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet, right? He promised the Holy Spirit was going to come. and We know He came on the day of Pentecost, 40 days after the Lord went back. But still, they don't have that yet. So I'm sure they did feel inadequate, didn't they? To go out and don't let that stop you from doing the Lord's will, you know? You don't have to be some polished speaker to teach a Sunday school class. You don't have to be some slick, you know, salesman that can really present, you know, persuasive reasons to be a soul winner. You just have to be yourself. You just have to learn a few verses and know how to show people the, a few verses and give your testimony maybe and, and just challenge them, confront them with their salvation. And, and that's all you need. You, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be a Christian for 30 years and know your Bible forward and backwards. So I was in a church a while back. And I saw a guy that's in his, probably in his 70s. And I just happened to notice that he'd been in church all of his life. Good church. Not, not, maybe not all his life, but all of this is adult life as far as I know. For decades and decades. And uh, it's somebody I like. He's a, a good guy. Uh, the preacher said, okay, turn over here to James. And I, I, I don't know how I even noticed out of the corner of my eye, I just looked over, and he was looking at the index in the front of the Bible to figure out what page James was, and to turn over there. And I was thinking, man, that's, for somebody that's been in church that long, you'd think they would know where James was. But for some reason, and, and, and I don't know the reason, he didn't. And I remember, for most of us that were raised in church, you learned that in kindergarten, in first grade, in Sunday school. Not everybody was raised in church, you know. Some people got saved late in life. But I know this gentleman was a saved and committed Christian for at least decades. So it just kind of struck me. Well, maybe, who knows, maybe he's dyslexic or something, and there's a very good reason that I don't understand. But, but some people also, on the other hand, maybe they've been going a long time and kind of not really... You know what I mean? Not really listening, not really into it. You know how easy it is to let your mind wander during a Sunday school lesson like this? And instead of learning a few key points to help our, you know, help our spiritual growth that week and be challenged and grow a little bit, we start thinking about, oh, Mark made the mistake of talking about fishing. Now my mind's out on the lake and I bet if I put a, you know, it's 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 mid-March, then big bass are probably starting to bite. I bet if I was on this certain pond right now. Put in one of those poppers, you know, and start plugging along. And, big bang, and all of a sudden our mind is, man, in, in the, into the fishing scene. And it's probably going to be a nice day today. Man, if you're ever teaching Sunday school preaching, do not make, mention food. Because the second you do, half of the people, they're going to start drooling and watering. And they're thinking about mashed potatoes and gravy and, and grandma's biscuits. They Amen. feel better at honey in there. And, man, I can't wait till I get out of here. Or... And so you've lost half the crowd already. You know, it is easy to do that, isn't it? To, to your mind is dis distracted and start thinking about other things. Maybe the preacher's speaking on a, on a lesson that you've heard many times and it's very familiar. And you just start wondering, don't you? Maybe that time the Lord had a special meeting, you know, something you've never gotten before out of that passage. And halfway through the lesson, he's going to make a really good point about that. But we totally miss it because we're not even listening. And... Sometimes you can get in that habit and you find you've been doing that for every service for years. 
for decades and not really learning anything, not really getting anything about, uh, about it. Man, what a tragedy that would be, wouldn't it? People do that. People li literally do that. Um, so, uh, that was a very long rabbit trail. But, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with fishing as a profession. It was great, but that's not what the Lord called them to do, amen? He called them to be fishers of men. So let me remind you, whatever your job is, whatever your profession is, that's great. Nothing wrong with that. But your primary calling as a Christian is to be a fisher of men. Let's never forget that. Let's remember that, you know, Jesus said the fields are wide into harvest. There are still people out there that are not saved. And if some Christian cared enough about their lost soul and shared the gospel on them, they would get saved. And so we need to live and be prepared and, and have our minds every day prepared for that opportunity. Amen. And pray, God, would you give me somebody today? I, I usually pray that. Would, would you show me somebody that I can witness to, to today? Or somebody that I can help? If, if, I, if they're already saved, maybe somebody that we can encourage to get back with the Lord. Or a good Christian that's already with the Lord. Encourage them, you know, to keep keeping on in the Lord, you know. And, uh, the, but we need to every day to be in the Word and be in prayer Sins confessed of. Ask. I don't want to be that worthless. <laughs> that worthless lay because I wasn't in the vine. You know, not bearing fruit because I wasn't in the vine. No, I want to be in Him. I want Him abiding in me, and that communication, you know, fully intact because I haven't been living in the flesh and living in sin. So, um, so you see, you know, obviously the illustration there. They were very unsuccessful when they went in their own. Uh, for their own purposes, went in the flesh, had their own idea, went where they wanted to go, said where they wanted to be. But then you see the contrast when Jesus showed up and, and said, you know, in, in verses 6 through 14 there, uh, he says, children, have you any meat? And they said, no. And so, what if the Lord asked you that today? You know, do you have any meet? Do you have any spiritual results that, that we can share today? Have you won anybody to the Lord? You know, it's, it's already mid-March. This year is almost a quarter of the way gone already. Have you done anything for me? Have you, have you done anything great for God this year? Are you, are you got two or three people at work that are, aren't saved that you're kind of working on, that you're witnessing to, or, or neighbors, or loved ones, or, you know, friends? That, that you're working on and that you've got, you know, been praying for and been looking for opportunities to, to further their, you know, their knowledge of Jesus and his, his gift for them, the unspeakable gift. And, and, you know, what are you doing? Have you any meat? Have you done anything worthwhile spiritually? Have you accomplished anything that's worth talking about? Have you, you know, have caught any fish? And so, uh, as far as... As far as they know, though, so far they don't even know who this person is. And then when he says, and then cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They still don't know who this person is. It's a stranger telling them, cast the net on the other side. And of course, back in Luke number 5, he had almost exactly the same miracle, didn't he? Where the disciples hadn't caught anything all night and told them to cast on the other side. So maybe it was starting to, you know, apparently they were, when it came to recognizing the Lord... They weren't very quick mentally to, to recognize them, but maybe this started to sound a little bit familiar because it wasn't until the next verse or two that, that John, you know, said, hey, it's the Lord. Um, so, you know, but they, even though they didn't know who he was yet, they did what he said. Maybe there was some authority in his voice or something, and they, you know, they didn't argue with him or hesitate. They just did it. They'd done this once before, so maybe it was starting to, sink in their mind, hey, wait a second, there's something going on here. And so, uh, like I said, it's, it's almost the exact same story and sequence in, in, Luke, in the first uh, Luke 5, which we won't have time to uh, read. But of course you see here that the, it says the disciple whom Jesus loved in the verse of number set, 7, we know that that's John. He always identifies himself like that. John said, it is the Lord. John is the one who recognized the Lord. And then what did Peter do? As soon as he heard it, he, he got on his coat. And he was, it says naked, but he's probably wearing a loincloth most likely. And he got on his, whatever this coat thing is, 
and jumped in, in the water and swam to him. You know, that's not the first time Jesus got, I mean, Peter got out of the boat to go to Jesus either, is it? And it's funny how John is the one that perceives quickly, but then Peter is the one that acts quickly. But both of them are things that we need to do, amen? We need to perceive the Lord and his, uh, his work around us, amen? He wants to do work in your life, doesn't he? We need to be able to see that and open our eyes to that. Say, well, what do you want to do in my life? Who is it that I can be a blessing to? What is it that I can do to further your kingdom on earth instead of just spinning wheels and doing the work and eat and sleep thing and not accomplishing anything of any value at all spiritually? What can I do for you, Lord? And we need to be perceptive about that, but also we need to be by Peter. And, okay, it's time to jump out of the boat and go do something for the Lord, isn't it? It's, it's time to, to jump out of the boat and go meet the Lord. Maybe we've been backslidden. Maybe we've been doing our own thing. Maybe we've been walking in the flesh, walking in sin, out of fellowship with God. It's, maybe it's time to jump out of that boat and go to the Lord today and say, Lord, I, I need to come back to you and I need to confess my sins and get my life right. I need to get right with you and get back into, into where I'm supposed to be spiritually, serving you and loving you and fellowshipping with my church and and, 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 and learning of you and, and these things and then, and then eventually doing what you want me to do. Peter was a doer, wasn't he? He got out of the boat and started, he, he showed action. All through the Bible, faith is shown itself by action, right? Noah, what it says in Hebrews, he believed the Lord when he said, there's, no, there's going to be a flood. What did Noah do? He didn't just say, I believe you, Lord, and then go back and to his, you know, farm or whatever. No, he believed the Lord. Then what? He showed action. He started building a boat. That's what faith does. And that's what Peter did. That's what we need to do, amen? We need to get busy about his business, amen? And so um, there, the other disciples start coming in, in the boat. Instead of the big fishing boat, I, I, I get the idea that they had a little boat like a dinghy. You know, sometimes they would tow those behind them. If the big fishing boat maybe needed to go to a dock where it was a little bit deeper, it was probably so heavy it was difficult to beach. And so the, the nets were so heavy it was so hard to get them up into the boat that they actually just drove the nets to shore and, with the dinghies. And then later, of course, Peter's going to actually drag them onto shore. You know, we're showing he's probably a pretty strong guy, you know, that... To, to, to drag that by himself, um, you know, he's probably pretty physically strong. Like I said, he's probably been in that business for his whole adult life. And uh, we don't know why they counted the fish. It says there are 153 fish. I think people that don't know why they counted the fish are probably not fishermen, though. If you have the biggest catch of your life, what are you going to do? You're going to count how big. You're going to measure, you know, this fish was 18 inches long. Most fishermen, of course, add, add about an inch a year to the... To, to the story of how their biggest fish was. But, but if, if you know anything about fishing and you had the biggest catch of your career, you're going to count the fish, amen? And so they, uh, there's actually people that quite question. I wonder what the significance of 153 fish is. You know, that must be mean something spiritually. Like, you know, days of the, until the, or years until the, you know, some biblical event or something like that. And, and not everything in the Bible has to mean, has to have a second meaning, amen? Sometimes it's just, there was 153 fish. And so Jesus called them back to fellowship. He says, come and have breakfast. They, they'd gone away, right? They'd gone to do their own thing. They went to the wrong place where he told them to go. But Jesus came to them and said, come and have breakfast. So he calls them back into fellowship. And, and um, this is the third time Jesus has presented to themselves here in the book of John. And so, their disobedience resulted in what? In failure, didn't it? In, in not catching anything. But when they came back to the Lord and listened to what He did, and did what the Lord said, they had overwhelming success. You have those two choices in your life. You can, you can go with your own, and work in your own strength, and get in a rut, and work and eat and sleep. And what spiritual results are you going to have when you go to heaven? You know, what are you going to have for crowns and results and rewards and what well, people are going to say, hey, you made a big difference in my life. And, and some of you guys, a lot of you guys in here have made a big difference in my life. And I can tell you that right now, that your faithfulness, 
um, and your love for the Lord and your enthusiasm. And, and, and when you when I saw you and your family go through hard times and difficult circumstances, that you stayed faithful and stayed stayed true. That that's been a huge blessing to me and helped me during times where I wanted to wander and go astray or maybe had a difficult, frustrating, stressful circumstance. That it helped me to stay faithful and true because I saw the the. You know the the testimony in your lives, and you, and just that has been a blessing to me. But I hope there'll be somebody that'll come up in heaven, Amen, and shake my hand and say, you know, if it wasn't for you giving to missions, I would have never been saved. Or if it wasn't for you leaving that track out somewhere, I wouldn't have got saved. Or if it wasn't for you sharing the gospel with me, and and maybe I didn't get saved right then when you you sat down with me that day at lunch break at work. But I thought about that two years later when some event happened, and I thought, you know. You know, Mark or whoever was right, I need to get back. You know, you, you, you planted that seed, amen. And so, <clears throat> if we want to have that kind of success, and ultimately, isn't that the success we want? Permanent success? That'll last past the, the you know, we were already talking about the other day. The Bible talks about our life like a vapor in three different times. You know, like steam. It comes up for a little while and just disappears. And, and, and we're also compared to grass. We, don't, we want our success, our results, our trophies and rewards to last further than just a steam or a, you know, a season of grass that grows up for a little while and withers, don't we? We want that permanent success. That's what I want. I want that lasting, the gold, silver type of success, not the kind that's going to burn away like stubble. I want the good kind, don't you? If we're going to do that, we need to stay in the Lord. Amen. Start by going where he said to go. He told him, go into the mountain and wait for me. And the Lord commanded us. To go to church, doesn't he? To, 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 you know, to, to meet with other believers. We need that encouragement. We need that uplifting. And, and, and we need to learn how to be better. We need to learn from our mistakes. And, and uh, learn how to love people right. All these things. Uh, but but it's being encouraging. We need to go where he told us to do. We need to do what he said to do. Amen. He said, cast your net on this side. We need to be doing that. If he said, go be fishers of men, we need to go be fishers of men. If we're not doing that actively, and then we don't catch any fish, whose fault is it? It's ours, amen? So we need to be in, in, in doing, going where he said to go and doing what he said to do. And oh, Just listen, obeying the Lord when he says to do something, it always brings blessings to your life. Just like these guys. They just did what he said to do and had great results. It always brings great results when you walk in obedience to Christ. When you do what he says to do, it'll, it'll bring happiness and joy in your life. Um, in the Bible, you, you can do a steady righteousness and joy always go together. I'm not saying it's always hard. There won't be trials, temptations, and difficulties. But if you live right, if you live holy like he is holy, and I know nobody's perfect, but if you, if you would attempt daily to walk that way, he will bring joy and happiness to your life because that's, that's how God sees success. Amen? And so... The, the Lord is using here some some uh, people that are going to go out and just turn the world upside down. These guys don't seem like that kind of people do that. They didn't even go wait for him for a few days where he said to go. They're confused. They're doubtful. They're walking in the flesh. They're not listening to him and understand what he said. He used just ordinary people like that. And, and if they would just obey, they would just follow him and be empowered by him, in which they are about to do um, in, in the next uh, two or three chapters, there's going to be thousands and ten thousands of people starting to come to Christ because of these, these guys right here, these fishermen that didn't even have enough faith to, you know, to do right for a few days, the Lord's going to send them the Holy Spirit and things are about to change in a big way, aren't they? All right, let's pray. We'll be dismissed. Thank you, Lord, for your words today. I pray that it be a blessing to us, Lord, a challenge. Pray that you help us to today to focus in on you and to learn from you and, and walk closer to you. And pray that you be with Joe as he preaches and the teachers and, and uh, June Church workers, Lord, as they minister today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we've got a few minutes.